Hey, Sharks fans, thanks for checking out another cast from Teal Town, USA. In this episode, we speak with former Sharks coach and broadcaster Drew Remenda, and we talk about the Sharks series versus the Vegas Golden Knights after the Sharks lose Game 3 in overtime, what is goalie interference, the play of Paul Martin, a new coaching staff in Edmonton, and missing life in San Jose. Fun to have you on uh, Teal Town, USA. Um, what did you think of the Sharks game last night? <laughs> Yeah, I, I liked it, except for the end, obviously. Um, I, I thought that they played extremely well. I thought that they dominated the game until they started taking the, period, the penalties in the second period. I thought that they they had done, and I thought actually in the third period, they were really good too. I thought that they elevated their game when they had to come back. It's just that when you look at that second period where, where only five shots, Vegas had five shots, but they had three goals, but the Sharks dominate first period they did a great job in the in the second they get the goal and they've got all momentum the crowd is into it everybody's getting excited as only the tank can and then they take a penalty and then a goal and then they take another penalty they they their, their penalties took the momentum away from them and as, as you know aj I mean, in 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 playoffs in hockey period it's about getting the momentum keeping it for as long as you can and then getting it back as quickly as you can when you lose it and unfortunately, I think that that when they lost it, it they they put themselves really they, in a situation where they had to scramble to come back from a game that they really, I thought, dominated for the first thirty minutes. Yeah, I gotta agree with you. I thought that the first, at, at the very least, the first twenty minutes. I mean, that first period. I don't know that I had seen the puck just find every shark and just it seemed every bounce was going their way in that first period. Yeah, and but that's you know, and I think it's because of the way that they have, have played that their game. I think it's because they 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 got the inside track to pucks. They were really good on the forecheck. They didn't spend a lot of time in their own zone. Boom, it was out. And they were they were executing going through the zone. I thought they did a nice job on taking away Vegas speed. They have wonderful speed, Las Vegas. Like. They have, the people haven't figured it out yet. That team's for real, man. That team is for real. And you've got to be able to find a way to slow them down. I thought they did that by having great back pressure, and I thought they did a great job of standing up in the neutral zone with D. And I thought, as I said, they, they went inside track to pucks all the time. And that's honestly about as good as 30 minutes as I've seen the Sharks play this this playoffs, and they've been really good this playoffs. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, Eric, you yes. know, you know, Eric, I'm sure. <laughs> I do know Eric. Hey, Eric. Hey, Drew. Good to hear from you, bud. Hey. Um, Thanks, buddy. Good talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you doing this. Uh, so overall, I mean, you kind of already got into it, but overall, what did you think of the series so far that, that debacle game one wasn't the greatest yeah. turnout, but they, I think the Sharks have made adjustments. Uh, what, what else would have, what did you think so far and work? What can they work on as they go into game four? I think when you look at it, like the first game, they just weren't ready. It, it, it was just, it was just like, holy mackerel, what the hell was going on there? And they just weren't ready to go. Even Joe Kowalski said, you know, I have no idea why we weren't ready to go. Sometimes it happens in, in a game, and sometimes it happens in a series. It's just, it just wasn't their game. And you, as you said, Eric, the adjustments they made. Now, they've made the adjustments by doing a great job, and you heard Logan Couture talk about staying above the play, and they don't get caught very often against Vegas anymore, where there's two or three guys getting caught deep. Their back pressure is really good. I think that's one of the adjustments they've made and able to, to slow Vegas down. What impresses me about the Sharks, and I think this comes from, well, I know it does. It comes from their coaching staff. It comes from Peter, and it comes from the, Rob Zettler, and, and the way that they, they act is that they're so calm and composed. It's, it's fun to watch that team because nothing really rattles them. You know, my, my last year with the Sharks was the L.A. series. We all know that series, right? You could see that team. Yeah, we don't want to bring it up. But, I mean, you learn from the lessons of the past, right? You have to learn from your mistakes. That that year, you could see them. I was I did inside the glass in those NBC games. And you could see the bench being rattled. You could see them being upset. You could see them getting out of sorts. Watching on TV, it, it, you don't see it at all. You see this team calm, composed, resilient. You see them disciplined. They don't change their game when things aren't going well or when they're behind. They keep playing because they believe in their system. They believe in what the coaches, that Peter DeBoer and his coaching staff has, has, um, 
has handed down said, this is the way we're going to play. And if we play this way all the time, or most of the time, we're going to be successful. They believe in that and they believe in each other. Uh, former Sharks coach and now Oiler coach guy I follow all the time, obviously, is Todd McClellan. Todd talks about a belief system. If your belief system is strong in your team, within your team, that means you believe in me, I believe in you, and AJ, you believe in, them, in, in us. You know, that's the team. If you have that with, within a team, that means you're going to be successful because you will do everything you can to make sure you don't let that guy down and you'll trust him to do the same for you. And I think I see that in the Sharks. I like, I like the way they're playing. I like their composure. I like how calm they are. And I would think that after these first three games, that the conference level has got to be pretty high within that Sharks room, knowing they're against a real tough opponent, but pretty high that they can, they can win this series. Don't you think there's a little bit more of a resiliency from this team specifically? I mean, we've seen them oh, yeah. from like three goal deficits in games. They come back and score last minute goals. I mean, like last night, they're down 3-1. And we've seen in Sharks teams in the past where they just get down and they're just psychologically out of it that they can't make that complete comeback. This year, it seems like that's all changed. Look at, look at Tomas, Tomas Hurdle last night. The guy was all around it the whole game, all around the puck, all around the net, chance after chance. Took a dumb penalty. Yeah, we all know that, but he, he bounced back from it. And then that tying goal, he was not going to be denied. You want to talk about resilience. On Resilience on just a shift it was a, kind of a microcosm of the way that team plays. He was determined. He was resilient. He was just not going to be denied from getting that goal. He used his, used his body perfectly, big guy, and he was able to, to just grind out that goal. And the payoff was, was there. I mean, so I, I look at that and think, yep, that's the kind of plays you need from everybody. No, no, no longer can you just rely on Joe Pavelski or Logan Couture or Brent Burns or, or Joe Thornton or back in the day, you know, with, with Patty Marlowe, Danny Boyle, you have to have everybody. And there's one thing I think that Doug Wilson has really done well of this year. How many teams do you know across the National Hockey League got faster this year from, from one season to the next? Doug looked at last year's team against, that played against the Oilers and went, we're not fast enough. Got to get faster. He relied on the young guys that he brought in and they played really well. So there, there goes again. There's the next guy. You look at Timo Meyer and the way that he's been playing in this series. You look at Chris Tierney. I'm a big fan of Chris Tierney. Yeah, I like the way he plays. He does a lot of things right. Um, Marcus Sorensen, you look at the way that those guys have contributed, just third and fourth line guys. That helps that resiliency because you're not just leaning on your top six all the time. Yeah, this to me feels like a more balanced team than 2016 that went to the final. And you bring up I agree. You bring up the speed issue. Do you think we see Yoakam Ryan get in after uh, some slow play from Paul Martin last night? Well, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah. And, and Paul, Paul's a veteran savvy guy. And I didn't like to play in the neutral zone in overtime. But I get it. What they wanted to do there, and then this, you know, talk about, about neutralizing the speed of the Vegas Knights. What they wanted to do, what Paul wanted to do was get over, get over and get on Neil as quickly as possible so he isn't able to make a play in the neutral zone. But, you know, James Neal's a James Neal. Hell of a play. I, if, if I'm coaching that team, I would have wanted to see Paul back up and accept the rush. But I was part of the coaching staff who lost 100 games quicker than anybody in the history of the National <laughs> Hockey League. So, I know, I'm now watching, I'm now watching TV. So, but, so I understand. <laughs> what they wanted to do was get up in the neutral zone as much as possible. You got that back pressure to help. So you want to stop the play before it even starts. So I get what he was doing. I, I don't know if you can throw a guy in. I think you've got to. I think you kind of got to go with with Paul Martin still, and 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 just you know, understand that he's a veteran guy. He knows what the situation's like. Sometimes you're going to have to, you know, discretion's the better part of valor in those situations. Maybe you're going to back up a little bit. You trust him not to make that read again. But at the same time, you look at that play, and I, I actually, you know. I was talking to KMBR today and, and Tommy Tolbert was saying, well, yeah, I just looked at the game and I saw great play after great play. And that's how goals were scored. You guys know me. You guys know how I broadcast. You guys know how I, I analyze games. I'm always the grumpy bugger who's, who's looking at whose fault it was. Right. You know? <laughs> so, so I went, yeah, okay. But, but it's, it depends on which way you look at it. 
So I look at that, that overtime goal and go, come on, Paul, you cannot give up that pass across the way. You've got to back up and accept the rush. On the other hand, geez, Neil makes a hell of a play on it. And the, the shot is all world. It's going to be, I don't care which goaltender's in the net. And I think Martin Jones is unbelievable. I don't care who's in the net. That puck's going in. So, you know, hats, hats off to him and then get him back the next day. But I don't know if you can throw in Ryan and go, okay, go for it, kid. Have a great, have a great playoff. <laughs> yeah, good, good luck. <laughs> good luck to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and talking about those goals and, and a great snipe shot, we saw one from Evander Kane last night. And oh. during the intermission, of course, you've got Jeremy Roenick saying he thought it was goalie interference. Anson Carter said, no, nope, nope. no way in hell it was. So you're obviously the you know, definitive mind on this. What do you say? <laughs> okay. I, 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 I talked to Rob Schick, uh, who's now one of those guys that's in the room on the phone now in, in Toronto mm-hmm. to back Rob, you know, ex, ex referee. And we sat together in a game in uh, Florida that uh, it was Boston, Florida, and, and the Oilers were in there this year after that game. So we sat down, we talked about goalie interference. And he said, okay, here's the determining factors. Number one, who makes contact? Does the goaltender make contact or is the the forward or the, or the offensive player making contact. Number two, where is that contact made? In the blue paint or outside the blue paint? Number three, is the contact incidental or intentional? And number four, does the goaltender have time to reset and find a puck to try to make the save? So those are kind of the determining factors they look at. All you have to do is look at that and go, okay, number one, who instigated contact? Flurry. Mark on Flurry, 100%. Cross check Couture right in the back. Yeah, but he's also, he comes in and leans in, right? Mm-hmm. And he's the guy that makes contact. And where's the, where's the contact occur? Outside the blue paint. So to me, they got the call right. I didn't, I, I thought when they, when they looked at it, there was, no, that's not goalie interference. It shouldn't be. Do you guys agree with me? Uh, absolutely, but you know we're yeah, little, yeah. we're a little biased. Yeah, just, a, just yeah, but but I don't think I don't think I think we can be cheering for the sharks without without being totally blind. I you know, you you, you, you you know you can you can look at that. And I, that's the one thing I've always loved about sharks fans. And I've always loved about to going into the tank is that honesty is is a policy that they believe in. They they don't want to be snowed. They don't want to be be told that it's it's this when it isn't. Um, they want they want they're a very knowledgeable group. This is an argument I used to have with a lot of people, but oh yeah, it's San Jose, you know, you know, it's like, no, no, they're, this team's been there 25 years. It's, it's not rocket science. It's hockey for God's sake. It's easy to, you can, you can start to figure it out once you watch a few games. Not that tough. You know? So it, when I, when I look at it and I, Sharks fans have always wanted to, to hear the truth. And I don't think that was goalie interference. I just, and I think when we look at it, it was not goalie interference. Completely agree with you. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, it was Jr. Jr. What's Jr. talking about? Boy, he, he <laughs> cross checked goalies harder than that in his lifetime for crying out loud. What's that guy talking about? He run right. through the crease and slew for them for crying out loud. Yeah. Oh. I, I remember him like in like a Minnesota series. He uh, he was like just standing in front of I think it was Brian Hayward for that matter, and just yeah. just standing there for the hell of it. Um, <laughs> And, and so there, there's been some changes in Edmonton. Um, Jay Woodcroft's going to yeah. take over for uh, in the uh, in Bakersfield. Um, right. What's what's Todd's new staff going to look like? Um, first off, Jay had the choice. Um, so in Edmonton, it's it's uh, it's a it's an interesting market and it's an interesting organization. In Edmonton, um, they had to do something. There was, and I, for me, firing the assistant coach to me is ridiculous. They were so good last year and all of a sudden they didn't know how to coach this year. Come on. Yeah. Jay had the choice. Jay had the choice. And, and Peter Shirelli had been talking to Jay for quite a long time, ever since they worked together at the World Cup of Hockey, about when are you, want, when are you going to take your own bench? When are you going to be set out? If you want to be a head coach in the league, this is what you've got to do. Mike Babcock, who Jay worked for in, in Detroit, said the same thing to him. You know, it's probably time now. And again, very personal bias. There's not a, a better gentleman, a smarter hockey guy on the planet as, and a harder working guy and, and more organized and trusted than Jay Woodcroft uh, is with Todd McClone. But Jay is fantastic. And he was given the choice. You could stay with the big club or you can go down and take your own team. 
and Jay thought it was a good time to go take your own team. And I don't know about you guys, and but living in California in um, November, January, February, December, those times, <laughs> it's not bad. Little easier, little easier living in Edmonton. <laughs> um, Jimmy Johnson unfortunately took a hit because the penalty kill wasn't very good this year. Um, a lot of problems in, in that regard. I don't think it was Jimmy, as you know, um, and he. He was relieved of his duties. Ian Herbers is the other coach. And Ian went, I think within an hour, he became the new head coach uh, of his old team, uh, the University of Alberta Golden Bears, where he's led that team to, I think, three or four national championships. So Ian's fine. So what Todd is doing is he's looking right now. My belief is that Trent Yanni's come to Edmonton. Um, Todd and Trent, as we know, we were in San Jose together when Todd first got there. Uh, Trent was in Anaheim. It was announced the other day that he is not coming back to Anaheim. Trent is an outstanding developer of defensemen. Look at Cam Fowler, Josh Manson, Hampus Lindholm, um, Sammy Vatman. He had a big hand in those. He's a terrific um, guy to counter off of Todd because sometimes you got to play the heavy, and Trent's very good at it, but he does it in a very constructive and smart way. He is a guy that uh, I have a ton of respect for, and he's got some of the best sayings in the world. So I love Trent. I think he's coming up. Um, rumor is Glenn Gullison, former assistant coach who Todd knows, who's actually from the same place as Trent's from, Hudson Bay, Saskatchewan, um, might be coming on board as well. But I think Trent for sure, after that, Gully might be a good choice to have another head coach type guy there. Um, but I'm not sure what else he's looking at. I think it'll only be two guys. It won't be three. One thing, uh, Dustin Schwartz, the goalie coach remains. Jeremy Capel, the video coach remains. But I would bet dollars to donuts that uh, the trend's going to be with the Edmonton Oilers next year. Uh, I think it's like there has to be some price that was going to be paid just because yeah. I, I was one of those people that had Edmonton taking the division this season. At the beginning of the year. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's but you know, it's interesting. So did a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And and then and that first the, the best game they played all year was the first game against Calgary. Connor got three goals, and, and they were amazing. But you look at that team. When we talked about Doug Wilson recognizing last year that that team had to, his team had to get faster. I don't know if you can hear that in the background. It's my dog who's just destroying a soccer ball. Um, <laughs> get out of here, George. Go away, George. I'm on the, I'm on the radio. Um, the, the other aspect was that the Oilers got slower. They weren't as fast. They lost Benoit Pouliot. They lost Tyler Pitlick, and they lost Jordan Eberle. And they didn't replace that speed. They've, they've got top-line guys that just aren't fast enough anymore. Milan Lucic, I don't know if you watch, guys, but there's a guy who really needs to change his game mm -hmm. in order to compete in the new National Hockey League. If you're not fast, you're not playing in this league anymore. So, yeah, so there, there are some things that went wrong. There are some injuries. Cam Talbot didn't play as well, but, you know, they call them career years for a reason. Last year, there were a lot of career years. This year, there weren't as many, except for Connor. And, and, you know, Connor's just, damn fun to watch i mean my goodness me he is he is everything that there's people have cracked him up to be he's fun to watch 200 plus point seasons and he was it was kind of funny you know when when things weren't going well um and they and it was near the end of the year and everybody knew where everything was going to be they weren't going to make the playoffs they everybody talked about the scoring race scoring race scoring race the only guy that didn't talk about it was connor but when you watched him play you knew he was thinking okay, I'm winning the scoring race. If anything's happened this year, I'm winning the scoring race. So he is a very determined athlete, but they've, they've got some work to do. They've got to make some changes in the summer to help Todd and whoever his new coaching staff is to become faster like the Oilers, or like the Sharks, I should say. Well, and you brought up weather earlier. I mean, aside from the weather, what is it that you do kind of like miss the most about just the city of San Jose? And Obviously, aside from being around the boys and everything down here. Can I say everything? Is that is that is that is that too broad of a subject? No. no, no I listen. No, I like it. No. Listen. I, I I will tell you. Then you know what? Uh, nobody was more heartbroken than me when I when I was relieved of my duties or not my, my contract not um, renewed. I loved San Jose. A huge part of my life as either a coach or, or broadcaster with the San Jose Sharks. I loved everything about San Jose. I still do. Um, I I still go back and I get I get greetings by fans that are just it's so heartwarming and so nice that they're that they still think of me like they do or else they're bsing me and I, but that doesn't matter i'll take that anyway they'll be asking me. i don't know. You know maybe they're just being nice to me feel sorry for me walking across the street all sad and mopey and look like i'm living in minus 60 degree weather every day which i am um when <laughs> there's just everything about it. there's the people that work in in the organization and this is not 
I, I know it sounds cliche, but it's not. They're family to me. I genuinely love these people. Uh, there's, there's so many people in there that I would do anything for. And, you know, there's, there's people that work in that office that I've been around since I was, I was going to say since I had hair, but that's a bullface lie, as you guys know. <laughs> since I was in my, still in my 20s. You know, I was 29 years old when I got to San Jose, and they're still there. And, and I grew, you know, I, got, I developed into a kind of mature uh, adult with these people. There's so many people who I walk in and it's just, it's like I'm home again. I've got my family, of course, but the, I talked to Doug Wilson when I was, last time we were there and Doug and I were sitting talking and, and we were just talking about the people in the organization and he, and we're trying, you know, trying to narrow it down. He said, well, because we're family. He said, you know, even if you're not with your family or apart from your family, you're still family. And I thought it was, a, it was the right way to put it. So there's so many parts about it, but also, and, and I know this, this is going to sound all like pandering, like I'm a WWE wrestler and go, what's up Cleveland? But, um, <laughs> The fans were so great. I don't know if you know this, but you can go and Google. You can search it out. And my kids love to do it um, because they think it's the funniest thing in the world. Edmonton fans hate me, like hate me. Um, Sharks fans, they're not so much. The Sharks fans are so good to me all the time. And I love being just walking through the crowd at the end of the game and talking to Sharks fans. I like being, you know, walking in the, in the Westgate Mall and, and having Sharks fans stop me and talk to me. Uh, I, I think Sharks fans are fantastic. They get the game. They love the team. They love the people associated with the team. They don't want you to BS them, as we talked about. They want to hear the truth. And I thought that Sharks fans and, and I had a, a great relationship with them. We, we kind of understood each other. We got each other. And, you know, I know I'm going on and on. But California and San Jose in the Bay Area is a great place to live. But it's, the reason it's a great place to live is because there's so many great people. I always have this argument with people about, you know, Canadians are so nice. And I always go, yeah, yeah well, <laughs> you know, I, I, I always have. I said, you know, go live in California for a while. Go live into the Bay Area and talk to me how great the people are there. We've got such great friends there still. But I, I look at the, the Bay Area as, as my second home. I loved it there. I, I love it there still when I come back to visit. It's, it's one of those things, though, it makes me sad and, and happy at the same time when you come back because I'm not there anymore, but I get to come back there. So it's kind of bittersweet, but it's, to me, it's, it was the, the best part of my life uh, professionally. Well, I don't understand. What, what, what do the Oilers fans have a problem with? Do they want smoke blowing up their backside? Or? Uh, sometimes sometimes they, want, they want to watch see the world. But you know what? I'll, I'll just backtrack a little bit. This is the way that broadcasting is going. And if you look at broadcasters throughout the National Hockey League, and this is being sent down from network, it's also being sent down from team ownership, they want you to preach, not preach, they want you to build the brand, promote the brand. I, I get that. Now, you know, here's, my, here's what happened. If, if you want my breakdown about what happened in San Jose with me, I can give you that. Okay. I started talking like a coach. Like I was a broadcaster, but I kept talking like a coach. I spent a lot of time with Todd. I mean, Todd and the coaches let me watch a video with them all the time. It was great for me as getting insight. And it was back for me, like my first love being coaching. And I watched, watched game, game after game with Todd and the coaches. And, you know, you start breaking down the game. When you start doing that, you start getting a little negative because the game, as Jeff Norton used to say when I was assistant coach, the great Jeff Norton, I would come down every period as assistant coach and I'd walk in the dressing room and Jeff Norton would say the same thing. Hey, Drew. And I'd go, yeah, it was pretty friggin' easy from up there, isn't it? <laughs> he used to say that to me all the time. Every game, we ever used to laugh at this. But when you start watching from up where I was watching, when you start watching the video, it's pretty friggin' easy from up there. So as the more I watched the video and the more I was around the coaches, the more I started to sound and talk like the coach which is fine and dandy as far as how right you are. It's fine and dandy for how honest you are. But as Greg Jameson once told me, yeah, but reading right doesn't make you bulletproof. And he's right. It doesn't. And I would understand if I'm an owner that's got, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars tied up in this thing and I'm, I'm getting, um, I've got my team being broadcast with my broadcasters. Why does this guy keep criticizing my team all the time? Why does he keep knocking my team down? Now, for me, I looked at it as I wasn't knocking the team down. I was just being honest. Right. But there's a way you can be honest without kicking somebody in the rear end all the time. So I think I started sounding less like a broadcaster and more like a coach. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if you, if you transfer that across the National Hockey League now with broadcasters, what you see is less and less analysis, more and more pumping up the tires. And there are, I think, some few of us analysts still left. A few of us. There's not very many, but there's a few of us. Even though it's Sportsnet. Now, I work for a network. I don't work for the Oilers, but I broadcast the Oilers games, but I work for Sportsnet. Even they want to say, hey, you need to be positive, guys. We're a partnership here with the Oilers, so you need to be more positive. Instead of, instead of you know, jumping on them every time they make a mistake or when a goal is scored or whatever, the game they lose the game, you've got to start, it, start to accentuate the positive. And so we did that this year a little bit more, and, and it was a tough year to do it, but we did it, and I thought we did it successfully without completely selling our souls. But I think you have to every once in a while. Brian Hayward and I were talking about it with uh, last time we were in Anaheim. Every once in a while, you gotta you gotta kind of sell your soul a little bit and and show the the reasons why things are good uh, versus the things that are bad. Because most people are cheering for the team that, you, that you're broadcasting, right? And you you have to kind of if you can find a way, if you can find that balance to be honest yet positive in the tone. You might last as a broadcaster, especially nowadays. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, I don't know if that, I don't know if that, that's a long-winded answer to probably what I didn't really answer your question. Why <laughs> Edmonton Oilers fans hate me? You know me, you guys. You guys have known me for a long time. I'm an obnoxious. I'm not a very nice person. I'm an obnoxious sob. You know that. No. I'm loud oh mouth. Gosh, I'm no. loud mouth. I'm long-winded. I'm I'm cynical. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not, so that's probably a few of the reasons why. <laughs> oh no. See, I, we have I, we have one guy. Kevin, I'll tell you a story. We're like, you know, it's minus 40 degrees and we're walking Kevin Quinn, my broadcast partner and I, we live close together. We live right downtown. My, my apartment in Edmonton is literally a block away from my, the longest part of my journey to the rink is the elevator ride down from my apartment. So that's, that's, it's great. Kevin's a couple blocks farther down the street and we always walk out together after the game and we're walking down 104th street where the bar, a couple of the bars are. People are walking towards us and, uh, and I've always got the same line when somebody tells me how much I suck. I, I we're walking along. I've got a I've got a toucan. I got my jacket up, my scarf on, because it's cold. And some guy yells. Some guy's walking away and he goes, "Remenda, you suck." And I said, I always say the same thing. I go, "Thanks for watching." And I keep walking. And, and, and he goes, "No, man, you make me want to hurt myself." And I went, "No, don't let me stop you." <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, just, I can't even i don't know i just i can't even comprehend that because i felt watching you and, and listening to your broadcast like i felt that i was learning a lot more about the game and it was nice to hear it from that perspective that wasn't a brand builder or a raw raw guy that was just very honest and raw about the analysis and i I, you know, obviously can't speak for the other 17,561 people, but, you know, I felt like I was learning a lot and no. Well, I'm that's not. what we wanted to do, right? We, we wanted to teach the game as much as we got it. Being, being a coach, being a guy that worked at Hockey Canada, being a guy that got his level five in coaching and, you know, did all that coaching certification stuff and taught hockey schools all over the place. I wanted to continue to teach the game. And then maybe that's what they, they don't like in Edmonton, but it's, uh, to me, it's, I, I learned, I, in this business, you got to grow thick skin, man. If you're letting if you're letting people who say that you suck or anything else throw your day off, then you're in the wrong business. If you got in this business to be liked, you're in the wrong business. We got in this business because it's an easy way to make a living. You know, it beats working for a living doing what I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you another story about how much how much I suck. Um, <laughs> so the the one year I went to hockey night, right? Okay, the one night, one year I went to the hockey. Remember that? Yeah. Oh, you went yeah. to hockey night. Okay. Okay. So Marty, Marty came in for me. We're doing the we're doing the playoffs. Don Whitman, the late great Don Whitman, and me, uh, doing the Calgary Detroit series. And game six in Calgary goes to overtime. Now in 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 Calgary they don't have a uh, bathroom in their press box. Oh, it's just up so overhead, and so you have to run to the public bathroom. So dude, we're going in now. We're going into double overtime. So I run into the bathroom. And I don't know if you guys, you're in the bathroom, right? Public bathroom, and you're, you're there, and you're doing your thing. Do you ever get that feeling when somebody's just, like, staring at you? He's not, he wasn't right beside me, but there's somebody, you know when somebody's staring at you, right? <laughs> okay. 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 When you're so, in a vulnerable position, probably. You're exactly. So, do my thing, 
wash my hands. And this guy keeps staring at me, keeps staring at me. And you know he's hammered, like totally oh. Labatt blue right up to the brain, right? So I wash my hands, we'll start to walk away. And he just staggers over me because I want to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. I went, okay, go ahead, man. I said, but I got to get back. He goes, no, 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 no. Listen to me. I went, okay, dude, fire away. <laughs> you are without a doubt. And I'm thinking, here comes a great compliment. <laughs> right? I'm ready to go off. I was ready to go off. Thanks very much, pal. Appreciate it. You are without a doubt the worst broadcaster Hockey Night in Canada has ever hired. <laughs> I went, wow, that's a long list, dude. And he went, I'm telling you right now, the worst. I went, as my usual line, I said, well, okay, well, thanks for watching. You know what he said? Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> 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 oh, well, see that, but that's that Canadian nice creeping in. Yeah, oh, man. Yeah, he just, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> On your way, you go. Good luck in the city, double overtime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Oh, um, well, thanks so much for doing this. I don't want to take up uh, any more of your time. We just have a, a couple of quick ones left for you, if you could help us out. Sure. We know that Eric's mom laid this out there. Uh, I want to say it was um, about 10, ago. 11 years ago, about 10 years ago. And we've heard it on a radio cast and, and, and used as a bumper and whatnot. Are you still in fact, a stud muffin? Uh, no, no. <laughs> I'm now 56 years, 56 years old. Unfortunately, stud muffin went away a long time ago. I have muffin tops now. <laughs> Is that, so I don't think I'm a stud muffin. I, I think she'll be okay with it. <laughs> she, she says hello, but yeah, we, we, we found the um, the promo the other day, and, and I had to share that. <laughs> yeah, what, what? My wife, my wife heard that, and she looked at me and went, "Who are you kidding?" Oh, oh my god! <laughs> I think we still have part of it here. Oh, let me see. I am a huge stud muffin and ass. There you go. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, then now you ask me why people have to know, like, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's why. <laughs> oh man well again thank you so much for doing this hopefully we can do it again down the road hey give me a call you bet you guys awesome thanks so much drew really appreciate it miss you bye right, guys All great right. talking to you again right, have a great See night, you night man you too bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. Thanks for tuning in to another cast from Teal Town USA. Remember to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Teal Town USA. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and find us on the web at tealtownusa.com.